right? 20 seconds. The Texas or Toronto tonight. All right, we'll call this general committee meeting to order. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here this evening. Acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that we are on the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississauga and Anishinaabe. We offer our gratitude to the First Peoples for their care for and teachings about our earth and our relations. May we honor those teachings. We'll now take 30 seconds to reflect on these principles. Please stand for the singing of the national anthem. And the Council for the City of Peterborough recognizes the principles contained in our Constitution and the Canadian Charter Rights and Freedoms. All right, Madam Clerk, any disclosure of pecuniary interest this evening? Mr. Chair, I'm not aware of any at this time. All right, we have two items coming out of closed session this evening. The first one, negotiations, that Council approved the recommendation outlined in Report CAOPC 23-004, dated September 11th, 2023, of the Chief Administrative Officer as follows. That Council directs staff to proceed as recommended in closed session Report CAOPC 23-004, dated September 11th, 2023, of the Chief Administrative Officer respecting the collective bargaining process. Moved by Councillor Duguay. Any comments or questions? All right, we'll take a vote. And that is carried. 
Second item coming out of closed sponsorship that council approved the recommendation outlined in report CLS CS 23-002 dated September 11th, 2023 of the Commissioner of Corporate and Legislative Services as follows. That staff be authorized to proceed as outlined in closed session report CLS CS 23-002 dated September 11th, 2023 of the Commissioner of Corporate and Legislative Services. Moved by Councillor Vasliadis. Any comments or questions? We'll take a vote. And that is carried. Thanks, everyone. We'll move to our consent agenda. Committee members, let me know if you'd like to speak to any of the following. 12A, modifications to transit service and 2023 operating budget considerations. Moved by Councillor Riel. And that's it for consent. So we do have one presentation this evening, 11A, Peterborough County City Paramedics presentation. And uh, we're excited to have Chief uh, Mello here. So, uh, Chief, thank you for being here. And uh, we appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Mayor and Council, to be here today to present our uh, key performance indicator report for 2022. And I appreciate that this person did all of that stuff because I'm sure I couldn't have set that up to properly work. Um, so just a little bit of uh, background in terms of our KPI reports. This is our fifth year now of pre presenting key performance indicator reports to the uh, Joint Services or PRLC county council and now city council. We have um, over the past really just reported on two uh, very specific metrics, call volume and response times. And I think, you know, to uh, properly plan and to properly inform the municipalities to uh, fulfill their obligation under the Ambulance Act to provide a service that meets the needs of the community, it needs to go much deeper than that. So through um, through our uh, analysis and through our, our management group, we've developed a suite of a number of operational key performance indicators, as well as now clinical key performance indicators. Really the reason being, if I simply come back to councils each year and say that we're meeting our response time targets and our call volumes going up, basically I'm telling you things are okay until they're not. And uh, if I put that another way, I think it puts you in a position as the councils in charge of this program to be, um, if I could use the phrase, Nero fiddling while Rome burns. Um, you know, we, we can say that we're meeting the mandates, but this is meant to show you what's happening behind the scenes, the trends in terms of our ability to continue to serve the community in the face of uh, system pressures. And it looks at other um, things that we should be looking at, like carbon emissions and, and things like that as we operate the service. So in background for these key performance indicators, they're basically built on a set of um, accepted, nationally accepted benchmarks that were developed by the paramedic chiefs of Canada. Many of you will know I was the president of that association for a number of years. They're meant to be universal, easily defined and applicable in, uh, in all regions. And also to, um, to analyze perceived value of, for your funding for the service that's operated on your behalf. So we take those and we look at them year over year. We compare against our previous year's performance. We set our planning strategies around the uh, KPIs. And where possible, we'll compare to other paramedic services. Unfortunately, very few in Ontario report an in-depth KPI suite like we do. And those that do are uh, sometimes not willing to really share publicly. Uh, there are a few that I'll mention as I go through the presentation that are involved in the Municipal Network Benchmarking Network, MBN. Um, most uh, most Ontario or most are municipalities in Ontario. I think uh, uh, Winnipeg is still involved in that as well, and they do report some measures for their paramedic services. So all that to say, uh, the true value I get from this is for me to help you understand the efficiency of our service, the um, stability of our service to to make to meet the uh, rising demands based on our previous performance and and sometimes our projected performance where possible compared to other. 
uh, paramedic services. So if I go back to the, what you would recognize that I would traditionally bring to you, uh, first of all, looking at our call volumes. In 2022, our call volumes went up at an unprecedented level. We saw our emergency responses up about 7.8%. Our less urgent 15.5%. This was something we've never witnessed before, and overall an increase of about 8.6%. So uh, this was quite interesting. We saw actual decrease a few years ago during the pandemic, and then we saw this sort of skyrocketing in 2022. I will tell you that we're watching 2023 because we're seeing a bit of an anomaly. We're coming back down. We're down about 5% on the responses. What's interesting, and you'll hear in our next. Um, evaluation of our KPIs is that our time at hospital has gone up about 47 percent. So while we have a decrease in call volume, our in, our, we have an increase in our complete time on task, which actually eats up any capacity we would have gained from that. We'll get into that a little bit farther into the presentation. Another way that we, that we analyze instead of just traditional call volume or how many times we sent ambulances down the road, we measure the actual request. Sometimes more than one ambulance is called for a particular request. So we've broken that down by our patient volume. So the actual uh, demand from the population, and again, that's up about 11.75% last year. And it's gonna trend down, we believe, in the next year. The other traditional um, report that we provide for, and this is mandated under the Ambulance Act is our response time performance <laughs> plan. We're mandated to set targets for patients in sudden cardiac arrest and then through uh, acuity levels one through five, and we have to set the percentage of time we think we can achieve a time target. Um, if I just do this very quickly, we are still meeting our mandate. This mandate, there's this plan was produced about seven or eight years ago. Uh, we've kept those targets. We thought they were realistic over the years. We've made adjustments in our staffing levels and deployment strategies to try to continue to hit those targets. We are still. Uh, you can see though that uh, if you look at it closely, the performance is deteriorating somewhat in 2022, and again, associated with call volumes and uh, other system pressures. More in-depth uh, analysis is available in the full package. The full package was on the PRLC agenda. Uh, you may want to look at that as well. It goes a little farther into looking at urban versus rural response time uh, performance. And obviously, we, we uh, by far exceed all of those targets in the city, and we fall short in the county for obvious reasons. And that's something we continue to look at with our deployment strategies, how we can improve the, the urban, or sorry, the rural response um, plans. We're doing that through some of the base positioning and unit deployment strategies we have. Another interesting measure for us is to look at our, I call the propensity to call, the volume of calls per thousand of population. Uh, overall, the city uh, is much higher than the county. Both of those are coming up gradually in their propensity to call. Uh, in general, we have a, a total of, <clears throat> excuse me, the combined at about 200 calls per thousand population. Comparing that to the municipal benchmarking network, they're at about 147. So we're, we're quite a bit higher than the average in this area. Um, anecdotally, we could connect that to an aging population, less um, options in terms of places to go for care than calling 911, perhaps in our region. Um, we're trying to address some of that through things like our community paramedic programming to try to avoid some of the 911 calls. But in general, our population does call uh, more often than, the, uh, than the, the mean of our comparator group. A few things that we look at um, in terms of our utilization measures. So first of all, being our utilization rate, uh, when you look at that in 2022, overall, we were about 49% um, unit utilization rate. So every ambulance busy 49% of the time in various configurations, not every single one always, but 49% of the time. It sounds pretty good, but when you look at it in the opposite way, that means that about 51% of the time ambulance is available and we want them to be available as much as possible. I think another, um, view of that is that industry accepted sort of rule on this is that about the 35% mark, you're now entering into an increased risk of not having an ambulance available for the emergency. So we're running at a higher utilization rate than we should be when you look at risk to the community in terms of ambulance availability. The next part of that graph is a measure of our unit level zero um, hours and minutes throughout the year. So this measures how many times we've had a demand for ambulance that is the same as or exceeds the number of ambulances available. 
And you can see that that drastically increased in 2022 to 181 hours or about a week's worth of time throughout the year where we didn't have enough ambulances to serve the, the calls that were coming in at the same time. There are always ambulances available. I need to make that clear. We're a seamless system across the province. It means when we're in that type of a situation, likely a neighbor is sending an ambulance to help us or an ambulance has to clear the previous call. But that shows you that the, the demand coming in um, meets or exceeds the available resources on a fairly regular basis. And that's something that we always have to watch. A few other uh, system deployment measures, or system design and deployment measures. The one that you're really familiar with and is probably the largest um, system issue that we're experiencing right now would be our hospital times. Every one of the measures of hospital times, we look at our average time at the hospital from arrive to leave, average time to offload from arrive until the patient is um, transferred care over to somebody in the hospital. Um, every one of those measures has gone up in 2022. And I can tell you it's continuing to rise at an unprecedented rate again this year. Our ambulance offload time for the same time period in 2022, January to the end of July, was about 3,887 hours that we lost in hospital, time in excess of 30 minutes after we arrived. We think taking 30 minutes to transfer care is okay. We give that away. That's This is a measurement of beyond 30 minutes. About 40% in 20. I should back this up. In, 20, in 2022, about 40% of the calls were over 30 minutes, so quite high. Um, averaging about 45 minutes of offload delay, so in excess of the 30 minute mark. So far this year, the number is 5,735 hours compared to last year's 3,887 for the same time period. So it's gone up a lot. 50% um, of the calls are delayed more than an hour. We average 58 minutes in, in offload time. So it's gone up significantly. If we look at that last year, we would have said that we were losing about 12 hours of ambulance coverage per day. So one shift per day, that's now almost a 24 hour ambulance that we're losing in that offload time. So it continues to be the one of the biggest, as I mentioned before, volume may be coming down this year, but this strain has gone up significantly. A few measures of around the care that we provide, where we measure the number of advanced care paramedics we have trained in our staff. We have two levels of care, primary care and advanced care. The advanced care training, generally paramedics have, have um, sought on their own. Uh, it's at about 33% of our staff are at the advanced care level. We'd like to see that come up and we've implemented a strategy this year. We actually have 11 of our current PCP, primary care staff that are attending training to move up to the advanced care level. So we find that uh, we found that this um, is something that we needed to move on to provide better care and we're doing that. Some of our finance and funding measures. So we look at three different things here. We're looking at, uh, and I'll add that um, some of this has been adjusted in 2022 for the most recent census. So we had a different denominator in our cal calculations moving up to now, but that's been updated for the recent population figures. We look at our cost per operating uh, per unit hour for every hour of the ambulance on the road, or staffed, I should say, our operating cost per call or event, and then our cost to the population per capita. I will note that that is all funding sources. So when you see $127 per head in our community, that 50% of that roughly is coming from the province and then the remainder split between city and county, but just gives you an idea of our, our operating costs per, co per uh, capita. This is an area where we're performing well, in my opinion. We did see some decreases in cost per event in 2022, but of course the number of calls went up, so that spreads the cost over or more calls. But if specifically looking at our cost per unit hour, that's the one that is most comparable to other paramedic services. We're at that 238 mark and uh, the MBN mean is, is 241. So we're a little bit below the, uh, the mean for our comparator group in terms of our cost to operate per unit hour. It's actually, in my opinion, quite good because the majority of our cost is around wages and benefits and we are one of the higher paid in the Eastern Ontario region. We also analyze the cost of maintaining and operating the fleet. This is something that um, has come up a bit in the past year. The cost for um, uh, the operating cost per kilometer is up. That's associated mostly with our fuel costs. 
we've had some changes in our fleet size. And I'll mention that when we talk about carbon emissions, our vehicles have gone back to being bigger ones because we couldn't uh, actually order the smaller, more economical versions that we used to get. They weren't available in the market, so they use more fuel. So we uh, we have had an increase in our, our uh, operating costs, also insurance costs. Maintenance has come back down a little bit this year, which is a good sign. Uh, we did have in 2021 a number of big ticket items, transmissions and things like that that we had to deal with that drove the cost up in that particular year. We measure also our vehicle, I say collisions on the slide, it's incidents um, per 100,000 kilometers. That could be anything, could be backed into a mailbox to actually having a collision. That number has crept up. That's something that our operations group looks at and uh, we design our training, we do retraining, things like that around that to try to make sure that we are operating in a safe manner, so continue to monitor. Carbon emissions, as I mentioned, um, this is a, a concern to me. We used to, you may, be, you may recall, we implemented a strategy to right-size our vehicle, add things like solar panels to try to reduce idling. We had uh, some uh, electronic devices on the vehicles, anti-idling devices. We made some significant progress over the years. Uh, we've lost a lot of that in 2022. Our total output um, has gone up significantly, uh, up by about 80 tons. Uh, again, call volume was higher, kilometers on the road were higher, and we have a larger vehicle in the fleet. We're trying to work with our vendors to move back to the smaller one that uh, produces less of a carbon output. But for now, uh, we're monitoring it and trying to address it through things like anti-idling, and deployment measures. We have traditionally reported on a few very um, um, sort of rudimentary satisfaction measures, looking at how many complaints and how many commendations we receive per thousand ambulance responses, and then also measuring the time it takes to close investigations. We've, uh, we've performed very well in the time it takes to close investigations. That has come down. Our complaints have come down, our commendations have come up. So those are all good signs. Last year, we, for the first time, and we'll be repeating it this year, we uh, issued a, a public survey to all of the patients who are willing to respond to us and asked a number of questions around their satisfaction level for the service we delivered. That's on the bottom part of the slide. It was a very good project. It's uh, provided some great feedback in terms of the confidence in our service at 83%. Our, uh, Provision of care, 87% being that good. An interesting measure, 47% actually surprised me how many uh, were very, were satisfied or felt we exceeded the expectations around response times. That's something you don't typically hear, but we had a, about half of the clients saying that they uh, thought our response time exceeded their expectations. Shows some disparity again between urban and rural and something we'll continue to look at. But overall satisfaction level was very high with our survey and we'll continue to do that again this year, but somewhere in that 90% 90, 90 range for overall satisfaction from our patients or clients. We have developed a suite of about a dozen clinical measures that are um, dashboarded in a, in a KPI approach. We do typical quality assurance through retrospective audits of calls for compliance for medical protocols, things like that, but we've developed a suite of clinical KPIs. You'll see a sample of four of those there. They're mainly around cardiac uh, calls and um, the application of advanced treatment for the most serious deal. Uh, you may recall I had 33% of my staff are trained at the advanced care level, but the critical patients received advanced care level 52.6% of the time. So that tells us our deployment strategy to get the most, the highest level of care to the sickest patients is working and we'll continue to improve on that as we have more trained to that level. Second measure looks at the time that it takes to get um, an advanced level of cardiac assessment to the patients that need that type of care. Heart and stroke has a target of 10 minutes. We were doing that eight, uh, eight 18. So we've uh, been doing better than the expected target. The third bar looks at how many times we have been able to successfully diagnose a cardiac patient that needs critical intervention from an interventional cardiologist. So basically in the field, we've identified that. We skip going to the eMERGE, we go right to the cardiac catheterization lab with that patient. You know, so we get the person to the right care at the right time very quickly. And we've done extremely well at almost 96% of the people that needed that care 
received it immediately, bypassed emerging went right to that uh, interventionalist. And the final one was looking at how many times the uh, advanced level of technology was used to diagnose the issues with cardiac patients, and that was at pretty much 99%. So those were very good uh, measures. Coming near the end, we also examine yearly our trends around injuries and lost time injuries. Our injury rate is up a bit. So how many incidents have happened, regardless of whether it resulted in lost time, our lost time incidents are up a bit. The good story here is on the second part of the graph, our total time that is lost due to those incidents has come down significantly in 2022. We attribute that to what we're seeing as a, de in a decrease of mental health uh, lost time claims and shortening of the claims and getting the individuals back into work more quickly. So we're seeing, although there are an increasing number of incidents, which you probably would expect with the increasing volume spread over the same number of staff, um, we're seeing that we're being able to manage those more effectively in the past year. So we're looking to continue that trend. On human resource measures, we look at the number of paramedic practitioners per thousand of population. Uh, just to sort of compare that to where you can see the needs are and where the needs are going and how our performance has been. So we've been relatively level in terms of our staffing over the past four years. As you know, we've increased staffing in 2023. So that graph will come up in the next year. And, and I think you'll see, hopefully you'll see some of those utilization numbers come back down. So it just kind of shows you we've been very, very stable in terms of the number of staff on the road um, and also the advanced care paramedics on the road, but we're making moves to increase those in the, Hopefully these KPIs will help to demonstrate the need. Uh, the green line on there, really, we continue to monitor the number of educational hours that we are able to provide to our paramedics on a regular basis. That drip, dipped down during the pandemic. We weren't able to do as much in terms of face-to-face -face meeting. So we brought that back up to uh, the level that's appropriate. So in all, I think the KPIs, in my opinion, Mr. Mayor, would show that we are performing uh, efficiently. Uh, I think we're providing an effective service, a good service, but the KPIs are definitely indicating that we have to be on guard, that the, the volumes are continuing to rise. We're going to look at that increased staffing that you've granted us in the past year to see how that may mitigate some of the, the concern. I think some of that will. We need to continue to look at things like 911 diversion strategies to move the, the, the volumes down and also to get to the patient, the patients to the right care at the right time. I think overall the KPIs show that the, com the commitment of our department towards corporate goals like carbon emissions, injury prevention, and being efficient um, and fiscally responsible. Um, so with that, it's really, you know, it's, this is an information only report. We're not coming with an ask for anything at this time. We're sharing this for your information. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate that. So we do have some questions, I think, Councilor Real. Um, to the chair, to Chief Mello, and certainly um, uh, thank you for being here. I'll move the report as uh, uh, as presented. Um, on page three of the report, the graph shows from 2022 that the acuity in the age demographic shows an increase in calls for service. But it also shows that there is an offload problem at the at the hospital. Certainly at the um, last term of council, and I sat on the Peebo Region Regional Liaison Committee, um, this was raised and certainly there was an ask for a number of paramedics and new ambulances. And um, we were able to secure money from the provincial government for some offload nurses at the hospital to try and alleviate uh, the buildup of uh, ambulances at the hospital. Can you please tell me what's gone wrong? Because we have this secured money. If this isn't working, and certainly I think of any of us, I'm not saying every day, but I've gone by the hospital when there's um, four or five ambulances stacked up, maybe even more, waiting to offload. And if they're not out in service and waiting for to offload their patients, that means that there's ambulances on the road to uh, to help the um, the uh, population, the city of Peterborough and the county. So can you tell me what's going to awry here with uh, the program that uh, – it was supposed to be put in place with PRHC and the uh, paramedic service. Thank you, um, through you, Mayor. I, I wish I could. I'd be a hero across probably in North America if I could tell you what exactly the you know the problem was. The the 
So I'll go back to the off of nurse funding. We still receive that funding. Uh, they've just increased it a slight amount this year, another 20 some odd thousand dollars. I think we're at a $470,000 uh, program. That money comes from the provincial government through the municipality and then is paid directly to the hospital to provide a nurse to uh, assist with offload care. The nurse can probably take four patients at a time. Uh, we bring 20 some odd thousand patients to the hospital. You can see that it probably backs the problem up by four patients and then it continues. So if we bring 80 patients a day, you know, it's, it's a small measure. Uh, there are a number of problems that are contributing to it. We're bringing patients there that should seek care elsewhere. So we're trying to develop programs like we now have an opportunity to refer um, stable overdose patients to the, to the CTS site where they can receive the appropriate care and hopefully wraparound services to try to avoid that. We need to expand those programs that bring patients to the appropriate places. We have very few choices in Peterborough. We don't have a, a number of, of, of urgent clinics and things like that. So that's, it's just another small program. We have a number of treat and release programs we're putting in place that so we don't have to transport as many patients. So we're trying to help with that. We're doing a few of those things. Those are one degree shifts. You're gonna turn 180 degrees, one degree at a time. So we're doing our few one degree shifts. The bigger issue right now, as we understand it, is the staffing and resource levels within the hospital. We have staffing shortages. There are times where I'm not able to staff some of the ambulances. I think the problem is even larger within the hospital. So that, that contributes to it. They don't have uh, the number of staff on duty at times that they need. Their beds are full. It's There are so many different pieces to this, this problem. We need to keep the one degree shifts happening. The offload nurse program is basically one degree. It's, it's helping a little bit, but we need to address all of those other issues that I'm talking about. To the chair, to Chief Mellon, certainly, you know, it, it's call, almost like uh, Groundhog Day here. I remember um, this conversation we had probably three or four years ago when we instituted this program. And and I'm not second guessing, you know, I mean, you're just making a presentation on the paramedic services, but we're going to be at budget time. And I imagine you're going to be around here asking for more paramedics and more ambulances. And that's a cost. And certainly, you know, um, don't mind if somebody, you know, retires or certainly somebody quits the uh, the service because it just isn't a job for them. But if we have a systemic problem where we're stacking up here and us throwing just more paramedics and more ambulances to accommodate uh, the needs in the community, we haven't solved the problem here. So it almost looks like um, I know a budget issue that we need to go to the province to say, hey, look, at your, you've given us the money, but you haven't held up your end of the bargain. And that's the, the what I can see uh, us looking at, you coming here and me making that statement again. So I'm just giving you a heads up. Don't mind giving um, the much needed um, um, paramedic service the tools to do the job. But if there's a systemic problem in the hospital, we could cure that. That frees up the trained paramedics and the ambulances to be on the road to do the job that they need to be doing. So just a comment. So if I could respond just sure. briefly to that. Um, I completely respect those comments, completely understand and respect those comments. And that's why I would never be here before you without presenting the full picture as we try to do with the KPI report. We know that this systemic issue involving the hospital is the number one driver to our need for resources right now. We also work on a regular basis to try to um, raise this issue and advocate where possible, whether that be through our provincial association to the Ministry of Health or through our municipalities to the EOWC and through the, the delegations at AMO that we were involved with, we continue to raise this as, as an issue. It is not our desire to build a larger paramedic service to offset a healthcare system problem but we are trying to balance that with the need to provide a safe paramedic service to the community. So we, we do take all of that information uh, to heart when we're making those decisions. We try to provide all that information to councils to help with the decision-making. Thank you very much, Councillor Leal. I have Councillor Burke and Mayor Leal. Councillor Burke. Um, yeah, thanks through Chair Beamer to Chief Mallow. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Um, I, just, I guess I, my first question would just be to ask for some guidance because um, in these issues where the systemic nature of the problems are being put on people that aren't necessarily um, the right people or don't necessarily have the proper resources. Um, it's been my experience that there's just a giant stalemate 
every, including the city, where it's just like, well, we can't deal with that. Um, so my question is, are these conversations happening happening collaboratively? Um, you know, maybe between you and the hospital and the city, um, are those happening? Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Mayor, this, this I've, you've heard me say this before. This is not a Peterborough problem. It's not a PRHC problem. It's not even an Ontario problem. This is happening across the country. So we are doing everything we can to work collaboratively with PRHC because there are things that um, we know are outside of their control, but we still need to address the issues. So we do things where possible, uh, like doubling up offload patients with one crew so that we can watch more patients. We're looking at ways to potentially um, help the hospital to find earlier opportunities to discharge patients to our community paramedics. We're doing a lot of unique things to try to work collaboratively with them. The other conversations that I think the really important ones are at that government level. Uh, this, this to me goes back to the Ministry of Health to the province of Ontario, looking at the system problem that exists in every hospital. It's in hospitals we never saw before. Roth Memorial is now going to get an offload nurse. They didn't have that, that need in the past. So it's happening in all hospitals. It's growing. So we do work collaboratively where we can to try to ease some of the pressure locally, and we try to advocate and provide the information needed for that work at the next level with government. Um, yeah, and then through the chair, one of the things that I got the chance to take a tour of at AMO was um, a program that really eased a lot of the precarity within the system. It eased time, it just kind of eased and gave people time to to navigate through um, what support was available. You said there's not a lot out there and you're right. You know, I think the type of equity um, and access to treatment and, and health supports that people need, I, I don't think that exists. Um, but what I saw was a mental health and addictions crisis center in London. And what was interesting about it was it was a collaboration between the hospital, um, the paramedics, the police, 911, CMHA, maybe a few more. Um, and, you know, you talked about, um, you know, 911 and diversion strategies. That seemed to me um, to be something that was working very well uh, in terms of taking that burden off of the hospital, off of the police, off of you. Um, and, in, and, and at the end of the day, it saved everyone money, right? And it freed up that capacity for you to be doing things that um, you're supposed to be doing. So do you want to speak to that? Is that something that we could ever imagine to have here? Through the mayor, through the chair, we're very interested in those strategies. We're actually having some discussions about how we could do something similar in this region. Um, I think it's going to depend on having... Uh, treatment facilities where we can transport to right now. We don't have that yet. Mm -hmm. We need residential treatment type of facility that could accept some of those uh, individuals who are in need of acute care, but and maybe to some degree crisis, but not hospital emergency level crisis. As I said before, this is going to take 181 degree shifts to change this. And that's another one that it might be more than a degree on that one. It's a good one. <laughs> Thanks. I think through the chair, I, I think the interesting though, thing, though, that I saw happen was, you know, for instance, someone overdoses in the back of an ambulance and they get turned out on the street, sometimes within the hour from the hospital. Um, and at least with this model, you know, people could stabilize. Um, they had a safe beds type of situation where people could find safety um, in terms of housing and having access to, to maybe outpatient support. Um, but it seemed to be like something that was working and something that um, a community like ours could benefit from. I do agree. Thank you very much, Councillor Burke. Mayor Leal. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, through your Chief Mello, thank you very much for your detailed presentation and please convey to your team <clears throat> our appreciation from the citizens of Peterborough, the great work that they accomplish each and every day uh, for our benefit. My question to you, Mr. Chair, um, a number of weeks ago, we had uh, a Chief Netzinger here from the Peterborough uh, Fire Service. He indicated to us that data shows in 2022 that the City of Peterborough Fire Service responded to 3,000 medical calls. Are the paramedics going to the same 3,000? Yes. Um, majority of the fire services have an, a, a tiered response agreement with the, the paramedic service. So all the lower tiers, we don't have an agreement with the city. That's something we're working on. The city has defined which calls they want to be notified and decide to, to go on. We do need them on 
those calls. Uh, they're they're mainly calls where time is extremely critical and the extra hands are, are needed. We can always review that, um, but at this point in time, we don't have a tiered response agreement with them, so I don't really have a way to analyze each of those calls and, and the reason they're being sent, but it's something we definitely work with them on. But um, again, back to the short answer, if they've responded, that's a tiered response, they're responding with us or ahead of us on those calls. If I may continue, Mr. Chair, then through to you, uh, Chief, then this is something you want to look at down the road because that would improve your KPIs, I would think, potentially. We would like to continue to look at that. One of the reportables in our um, response time performance plan is when the first defibrillator arrives to a cardiac arrest patient. Right now, that could be occurring with the fire service, but we don't have an agreement. We don't share the data, so we don't know when that necessarily occurred. It could be improved. We could witness improvements in some of the statistics. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mary Lil. Any further uh, questions for the chief? Chief, thank you for all you do and uh, your team, of course. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so moved by Councillor Real to receive for information. Any uh, comments or questions on the report? We'll take a vote. And that is carried. All right, moving right along. Uh, modifications to transit service, Councillor Riel. Um, through the chair, I'll be moving the report. Uh, as you read through this report, you can see that we've been busy putting together a transit liaison committee. We have had several meetings since its inception, analyzing what are the positives or good parts of the transit system and what are the negatives or bad parts of the system. There are several recommendations we believe that are low hanging fruit uh, that will not cost a lot of money and with limited resources made sense to change. When you read through the report, you will rec uh, uh, we are recommending improvements to some services that were already high ridership routes. There are some routes that you will see we're going to give them 15 to 20 minute service and others at 30 minutes. The Transit Liaison Committee is on a path to give the city of Peterborough an on-time reliable transit system. We ask for the transit user their indulgence to give us um, time to get the transit system, the time it needs to get it back on course. This will take and will and the will of council at budget time, the money and the resources to get the transit system that we, uh, we gave our word, uh, that we will give you a 15 or 20 minute service and then we will get them on time destination anywhere in the city. When we started this, it's like trying to stop an ocean liner. It doesn't stop on a dime. Uh, I believe at the end of the day, we will have a hybrid model of the grid and the hybrid uh, the hub and spoke. Uh, I leave you with a challenge to the city of Peterborough. Why not give transit a chance or take transit? Why not take transit? Finally, I would like, uh, or I would be remiss in not thanking Councillor Kevin Duguay. Certainly at our last meeting in, uh, in the summer, he was instrumental in putting a round table together with city staff and certainly uh, the uh, Transit Liaison Committee where we, most of the stuff that you see here tonight was, um, was the working of the, uh, the uh, working of the minds between uh, staff and uh, certainly the Transit Liaison Committee as we laid out the routes that we would like. I'd like to thank city staff, ETU members, and the citizens that put their uh, names forward to sit on the uh, Transit Liaison Committee. Again, I'm recommending this. I, I think it's a step forward. It's not a whole bunch of money that we're going to spend here, but if you want a transit system that's going to reduce the uh, climate emission change or climate emissions in the city of Peterborough, if we're going to get a transit system that are gonna move people on time into their jobs, to their appointments, um, certainly a benefit to the seniors and the handicap in the city of Peterborough, you're going to have to spend money. So this is our first report, certainly coming back from that committee. 
I, I think it's um, I think a lot of work has gone into it and I hope that you'll approve it. Thank you very much, Councillor Real. Uh, speaking to that, Councillor Vasliadis. Thank you, Chair. And yeah, I, I do want to thank the uh, Transit Liaison Committee. Uh, it takes a lot of work really to come up um, with some of the recommendations here. And I do want to thank the, my two fellow councillors, Councillor Real and Duguay. Um, again, the time put into this um, is it, hard to find some time in a regular day. So, and I think I've said this over and over again that uh, transit needs extra attention. And this is an example of it too. And that's why this is a separate transit um, committee uh, instead of a transportation one. So uh, it being one of the co-authors of the, the motion that, that created this, it's nice to see more of the, the, the finer details of transit riders and, and what they, uh, they feel will make the transit system run smoothly. So um, I, I, again, I appreciate all the time put into it up into this point. I know there's going to be a lot more hard work down the road uh, trying to make our, our transit system work smoothly. And uh, it's no easy task. Trust me, I know. So uh, I just have a few questions um, to staff uh, through you, Chair. Um, when I look at item C, um, it's proposed uh, enhancements. It talks about four full-time drivers and two supervisors. Is there any way of telling me the, the offsetting revenue by hiring a driver, uh, the value in that? Is there any kind of monetary value in, in hiring, hiring a driver? For you to Mr. Papadakis. Uh, through, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, I don't have that information available at my fingertips. I, I might look to Mr. Is Mr. Wakeford able to do some back of the envelope math on on the fly? If not, we can get that information for you and we'll, we'll report that back to you. And again, what, the reason I ask is I think and whenever we OK anything uh, with uh, money involved, of course, with our upcoming budget, uh, justification has to be there. And through the report, there is a little bit of explanation, but again, um, we, I want to see what the value is in, in, in hiring the driver or, or the supervisors too. Um, so I see the on-demand pilot as being replaced with just regular routing. Is there any other um, um, cost savings uh, after uh, replacing that, or is there any extra money that will will be saved by uh, by uh, replacing the on-demand pilot project? Uh, th through you, Mr. Chair, yes. Uh, Cancelling the on the on demand con um, the on demand service has an annual uh, service contract that is uh, that is um, incurred to, by by the city. So um, there is there are costs savings as a result of canceling the on demand service. Um, however, uh, the need to hire additional drivers are required to offset the loss of service coverage because right now we use on-demand service to uh, sort of provide a asynchronous coverage of areas so we're not having to have regular service in those places at that time. So um, there is a bit of an offset there. Um, I might look to Mr. Wakeford if he has the, uh, the, the number, approximate value of that on-demand contract available. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, not at this at moment. It's pretty close to um, maybe a wash or we'll, we'll save a little bit per month. The benefit of that is um, more of a dependable service where we're not overlapping and we're, um, you know, it's, it's, you walk out, the bus is there not having to book it and, uh, but it's more dependable for, uh, especially our um, staff that aren't as tech savvy. Uh, and I also have a, another question just about our contractual obligation to Trent uh, University and Fleming College. Uh, it says it, um, it we generate uh, $3.7 million, a little bit over that per year on that. Now, is that money, was there every consideration to put some of that money aside so that we can fulfill our contract obligations just in case there is a, there is a, a shortfall uh, when it comes to the money uh, that we need to continue on with the rest of the year? Or um, is that a consideration? I guess, I guess I'm concerned with it because they are the only group that actually pays up front from what I understand. And um, 
again, would money be considered to be put aside so that we all, we can always uh, fulfill that obligation, or is it just put into the the overall budget? Uh, so to, through you, Mr. Chair, short answer is is no. That the, the contracts are 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 to provide service. They're not to fund. We don't have a reserve provision or any sort of contingency provision in those contracts where we would take money in a given year and um, save that for future considerations. So that money is, is it pays for the transit system overall then too. Okay. Um, and I'm just wondering too, with the uh, transit committee, so what is the, the system? And I see it at the back of our reports, the actual, the new route system, what is it considered? Is it considered a hybrid or how did um, transit come up with this particular uh, route system? So through, through, uh, through the chair, um, what what we what the work we did with the transit liaison committee first of all was uh, to ensure that they had uh, all of the information available to them about what work has been done since 2018 when it was originally um, uh, when when the city originally realized that the the former system had we had already outgrown the former system and it was already starting to cripple under the weight of a uh, a growing community so the uh, what the the routes that have been um, uh, the route adjustments that have been proposed are, are more, I would say they're minor tweaks to the current system that were done for either a uh, an operational improvement because the suggestion came from a driver in terms of things they had heard from, from users, uh, or it was something that was considered uh, partially uh, with the input from the committee around maybe making a route uh, be a little simpler so it's a little it's more it's easier to understand so the ease of use and accessibility of what the route is trying to accomplish is a little bit more straightforward so the um the 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 the, the nomenclature around you know like we we've, we've never had a like the city as it exists today doesn't have a pure grid it never could have a pure grid because we're not on a pure grid due to the topography and the way that our city has evolved over you know uh several hundred years um so i I'm, I'm i'm almost reluctant to say what nomenclature i want to put on it i'm just going to say this is the current transit system that has been studied at length that provides the community with a framework that is best positioned to meet the needs of the long-term growth that we're looking at between now and 2050. great no thank you and if we if you could separate out all the items chair that'd be great thank you Thank you very much, Councillor Vasiliadis. We will do that. So I have Councillor Lachika, Mayor Leal, Councillor Crowley, and Councillor Duguay. Uh, Councillor Lachika. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, I, I also wanted to just recognize that it's been very swiftly that this committee, the Transit Liaison Committee, um, has gotten together numerous times over the summertime and uh, what commitment to, to put minds uh, collaboratively toward making our transit system more efficient, making it better. So thank you to Councillor Riel for, for leading that charge and to Councillor DeGay for the time spent there. And, and um, also to staff and, and uh, all that you've done to, um, to, put, to put efforts towards making um, this investment go forward in a positive way. And I'm, I'm drawn to our strategic plan and how, you know, in hindsight, we, we look back and we've learned that an investment in transit as well um, is key to improvement, growth, uh, climate action, a greener city, a more future prepared city with fewer cars on the road. Um, and uh, less fossil fuel emissions being burned. In fact, um, the part of the report that really struck me is that 53% um, is the increase in ridership in one year um, that since, since we've made some decisions to go forward and, and to make these efficiencies and this collaborative work happen around our transit system and our routes. That is around 500,000 people increase in ridership and that's significant so i think that we should be encouraged continue to be hopeful and thankful to our transit workers who who work tirelessly as well um and 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 our new manager thank you barry for all that you do thank you very much mr chair thank you very much councillor lachica thank you for that mayor Leal. Uh, thanks very much mr chair and there was um 
certainly during the campaign of last uh, September and October, uh, people were talking about transit uh, at virtually every door. It, it seemed that our transit system, uh, while it was working well for Trent Fleming students, uh, wasn't working for anybody else. And when you look at uh, our budget document for 2022, uh, you could see that there were enhancements year in and year out uh, to the transit system uh, without producing, I would say, any uh, significant results. So I, I want to recognize um, uh, Councillor Beamer here in his role as Chair of Finance, because when he moved a motion, the 2022 budget, to uh, freeze some funding, that was a very important shock and awe moment, because what that allowed us to do is start to peel the layers of the onion of the transit uh, system, uh, bring in the liaison committee, the work of uh, uh, councillors Duguay and Riel, and now we have, uh, it appears to be a transit system uh, that will be hopefully meeting the needs of our, our public here in Peterborough. The fact that we're getting rid of this uh, on-demand service, uh, uh, that's quite a blessing. Uh, I never heard one complimentary remark about that service on the campaign trail. So I appreciate uh, that it's going to be uh, eliminated uh, when the contract expires uh, uh, next month. And um, I think these recommendations appear reasonable uh, to restore the faith uh, in the uh, Peterborough Transit System. Thank you, Mayor Leal. Appreciate that. Councillor Crowley and DeGay. Councillor Crowley. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I just have a couple of quick questions for the uh, regarding the sort of IT portion of the transit, um, regarding the 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 Peterborough On Demand app, um, is that app going to continue in some form as sort of a Peterborough Transit informational app? Is it going to or because I know right now it's the way that you can use to call the On Demand service, but is it going to just roll into maybe just an informational app? After this, so three, three, Mr. Chair. So there are a few different uh, technology solutions that are available to um, users of the transit system. Mm -hmm. um, I'll start, and I'll ask Mr. Wakeford to jump in and supplement if I've overlooked anything. But there is a an app that's actually called Transit, so you can download it from your your app store, and it has routing and scheduling information, and you can plug in things that will help to route, route finding. Um, our, our routes are also uploaded onto Google, Google Maps, so you can do your route finding on Google Maps as well, and you get that as well. Uh, and then we also have some functionality embedded in the Hotspot app, Hotspot app, which folks will have for our parking services, but then you also have the ability to buy fares for the transit service on your hotspot app, as well as having some, I'd say on that app, a bit more of a rudimentary route finding type of a service available to you. But I'll just quickly look to Mr. Wakeford and see if I've missed anything. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the VIA app, actually, VIA is the company that owns the app. So um, if we collapse out the on-demand, they still provide our handy van service, our um, paratransit service. So that app would still stay active um, when we roll in that opportunity for our van passengers to use that app to book. Oh, okay. Um, if if we no longer use Via, then that app would no longer be available. And we are uh, have been talking in the past with uh, Fleming College. They're very eager to get involved and in, and in develop an app for us. Also, something we need to re-engage those conversations because they are technical and they would like to contribute also. Right. Oh, that's perfect. No, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yep. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Crowley. Councillor Duguay. Thank you, Chair Beamer. I'd like to start off by thanking uh, the leadership of Councillor Rael. While he thanked me, um, he's uh, taking the, has taken the lead. It's a formidable task. Um, I understood when I was first uh, being considered or for the committee, it was going to be a four-month term. I, I missed the qualifier it's four years but i'm happy to serve and i will continue to serve happily i'd like to i'd like to acknowledge um as well mr barry wakeford a city staff that during my time with the transit liaison committee if i've had a question about transit clarifying routes and operation barry has been it makes himself available and has provided valued and valuable information so thank you mr wakeford um, i'd like to speak to briefly about some of the short-term gains 
um, at the, uh, we had about a two and a half hour uh, workshop with city staff transit liaison committees. And one of the priorities identified through the uh, committee as Councillor Reals identified rightly as low lying fruit was communication and information, understanding transit. And arising it from it was a simple thing that to a person, all the participants said they would like to have available when they ride the bus to have access to a fold out map. Now it's something we may have got rid of, but here we have a group from the, our community saying that's something that they value. And they also said the map as we know it was very cluttered and difficult to read. If you consider page 12 of the staff report, the transit map is clean and simple, easy to read. That's low lying fruit. That's a result of your transit liaison committee. We also identified uh, other measures that at bus stops, for example, there should be a map at every shelter say you're here. Because we assume, we can't assume that everybody knows exactly why they're at the bus stop, but to understand the bus routes, a simple low lying fruit. And when we are in London and other cities, that's very common practice. So that is again, something that arises from our uh, transit liaison committee. Now, with respect to routes, one thing that, um, and I, I agree with uh, Acting Commissioner Papadakis, where he's identified, we don't, have a, we don't really have a grid system in the strictest sense, but we do have a number of major roads that this city has approved an official plan recently. And our bus route, as planned, every, all of our major transportation routes, every single one of them will have a bus route. Park Hill Road, Braley Drive, Sherbert Street, Lansdowne Street, Shamong Road. Those roads alone are our future growth corridors. Every one of those streets has a transit route now, which means every time we add another apartment, another store, ideally another business, there will be an increasing need to use transportation. We don't have to reinvent the route. It's there. So that's important. Um, I also... Uh, um, I, I just had one, two questions. I, I acknowledge as well the increase in ridership. That's that's incredible. Six hundred thousand persons. That's a, that's a lot. Even if it's the same person taking, if I have the number right, did I read that right? Rides, not persons. Rides, but even if that's the same person that's used the bus twenty times in a week. That's still six six hundred thousand rides, and that's very encouraging. Um, I had one question of staff with respect to future growth. I noted, uh, for example, um, Lily Lake, the secondary plan, which would appear to have bus route two or bus route eight would be its closest bus, I believe. Um, is it, will it be, when, when the time arrives, when that subdivision and that growth area builds out, will we be, will a transit liaison consider um altering this for our ex route, transit routes uh, th th mr. Th Chairman, th th through you mr chair when when a uh, a new subdivision uh, builds out and there starts to be uh, that we do have to consider what changes we need to make in terms of expanding one of the benefits of this system as when we're comparing it to the the legacy system um, is that it has the ability for us to make tweaks to be able to adjust it without radically throwing off our route timing and um, trying to coordinate all 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 services coming back to a single point. Um, so the timing of that uh, will be a little bit in flux, but it is essential that our new greenfield areas also have uh, reliable transit service at the outset because when people first move into a home is when they start establishing their travel patterns and habits. And we want to make sure that a reliable transit option is one of is is an available that is of consideration at the start. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's a very important matter to consider because the city of Barrie, for example, um, has experienced introduction after the fact of uh, uh, multimodal transit systems, and it's been very difficult to integrate. Where, by comparison, the town of Oakville which has relied upon it from day one, their ridership numbers are much higher. So if it's built in and becomes part, de facto part of that community, it, the ridership rates will uh, should be in place. Um, I would like to finally then, Mr. Chairman, with respect to the report, I would welcome on item C specifically, uh, some just some additional information from staff. If we add some drivers and we add some 
supervisors, I think it's four and two respectfully, uh, what might be the corresponding revenue that might be generated arising from um, same. And like his worship, the cancellation of the on-demand pilot, um, I, it is welcomed because we had unfortunately, um, I think an inefficient use of staff and buses and ideally now with what we've seen with increased ridership and more efficient routes, we should have full buses generating more revenue. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor DeGay. Any further comments or questions? Councillor Baldwin. Thanks, Mr. Chair. You know, facetiously, when I was listening to uh, Mr. Papadakis, he was talking about apps and I was thinking appliances. Um, I guess I'm showing my age and I was wondering what kind of training or learning curve would be needed to use the app. But then I recall I have eight grandkids and those that are over five could probably show grandpa how to use that. My question through you, Mr. Chair, goes to uh, Mr. Freeman. Richard, the, uh, the $941,000 that we're looking at giving you the opportunity to use to keep our service up and going to cover the operating expenses for the balance of this year. Is that figure 941, is it in the proposed range that we're looking at for a um, increase to the taxpayers next year? I'm, I'm gonna make the assumption that yes, it is. If we but say we've got to put it in to maintain that service. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, the when staff presented the status quo uh, in terms of the guideline report, the 941 was in the 5.6%. That was the assumption that we made, but that was the extent of it. Um, you know, the comments, you know, respecting recommendation C, you know, we didn't include any other additional enhancements in that, you know, in that status quo. Council, of course, come back and said the upper limit of your target is 5.5. Um, so, you know, given that the that's very close. I'll say yes to the 941, but but nothing else. Thank you. Okay. So that, that's a good clarification, I think, for council to, to hear. And so if we're going to provide those enhancements of 340,000 and or 256 for full-time drivers and two complementary supervisors, that would be an enhancement that right now isn't in the range of 4.5 to 5.5%. .5%. Have I got that correct? Well, Mr. Chairman, I would agree with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Baldwin. Councillor Purnell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am looking at item C, which is dealing with the four uh, new full-time drivers uh, plus two new supervisors, and I'm wondering if you know how many how many people um, will be made available when the on-demand is removed. To you, Mr. Chair. I'll ask Mr. Wakeford to chime in on that one. Thank you. Oh, we would need, like, um, sorry, through you, Mr. Chair, like uh, Mr. Papalak said, we will need to increase staff a little bit to um, put fixed route back on when we collapse the on demand. Sorry, I didn't really understand that or hear it. So I can clarify. So we can, so the cancellation, so on demand is a way of providing service with fewer drivers. So by canceling on demand and replacing it with um, fixed route service, we need to we need additional drivers. So how many people are in the on demand service right now? Through you, Mr. Chair, we have um, five on weeknights and eight on Saturdays. Okay, and may I ask what the two new? Well, why do we need two new supervisors? for essentially for part-time drivers or full-time drivers. I know it's not quite apples to apples there, but do we really need two new supervisors and what will they be doing? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the supervisors would be on street. So at this point in time, we have very little on street supervision. So it wouldn't be just for those four drivers. It would be for all staff and it would give us an on street supervisor pretty much any hour that a bus is on the road. So presently we don't have that coverage. And so that gives us the opportunity to provide support to drivers if there's an issue. Um, we don't we don't have we have people on call, but that means we have to call somebody in to maybe attend a collision or deal with an issue, whereas this would have somebody uh, on site and avail available for 
whatever situation we may be facing. So it's it's support for the drivers um, in in their role as driving, and it takes some of the pressure off of them. Okay, um, and through you, Mr. Chair, uh, hiring two additional supervisors does that mean we have to then buy two more vehicles, or do they offset each other on shifts? Through you, Mr. Chair, we have the vehicles already. Okay, thank no, you very no much. No new vehicles required. That's okay. I like that answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Purnell. Any further comments or questions, Councillor Hakey? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, just some comments, if I can. I had called Councillor Riel this afternoon. I want to thank everybody because the first problem that I had when I got back on council was busing, and it didn't stop. It didn't stop once we struck the committee because people didn't believe that it would complete its task, which it has done, and it has done very thoroughly. Um, and I'm afraid that if we keep talking any longer, the ridership's going to go up another 100,000 because we started at 500,000, went to six, and we're it's like we're bidding on it. Um, it's something that we all deal with. The routes, to me, are very plain. I took the bus from the north end to go to Portage Place. I had to go downtown, see my office, go around and go up. It was it was a painful experience. So um, the committee did exactly what they said they do, exactly what we hoped that they do. I'm not one to uh, spend dollars easily, but with the ridership increase, which I think is, is the comeback from a lot of it is the comeback from um, uh, you thank you, COVID, the two years that we had. Um, plus, if we make it more convenient, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, that's pretty convenient for people. Uh, we're trying to uh, lower the greenhouse gases, which I think we can do. Hopefully, we'll get to a point where we'll be able to drive smaller buses that have people in them versus the bigger buses. But uh, all in all, I do support this. And uh, again, thank you very much for all the work and the citizens will reap the benefits for sure. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Aiki. Any further comments or questions? Just quickly, I wanna thank Councillor Real. And the only cautionary comment I'd make is four of my colleagues have mentioned this already and Councillor Baldwin sort of hit it right on is just the uh, the, the six FTEs are not in the, the 4.5 to 5.5. So uh, to find that in the 4.5 to 5.5 would mean probably efficiencies and cuts to make room for that. And of course, we have a lot of other uh, um, requests, I think, you know, probably the police are looking for some officers. And uh, certainly one thing I'm hearing in the community is concern around uh, um, crime and perhaps the need to look at uh, some additional resources there. I'm not on the board, but that's just what I'm hearing. Um, and uh, there's a lot of requests, so just a cautionary comment uh, that uh, this is six new FTEs that will now somehow have to be found in the 4.5 to 5.5, which means staff will have to uh, make some cuts or efficiencies. So it, you know, folks, you know, we can't be all things to all people. Um, so those were just some comments, just repeating for my colleagues. Um, Councillor Parnell. Thank you. I did just think of another question. Um, and based on your comments as well. Um, I'm just wondering if staff did an analysis to see if these six new hires would be self-liquidating. We used to have a rule around this table uh, that any new position had to be essentially self-funding. So do we anticipate the ridership will go up enough to pay for these six people? Has anybody done that analysis? Through, through you, Mr. Chair, I will say that transit services all around the world are not fully cost recoverable. It is like transit service inherently has a subsidy, a subsidization, subsidization required by all of those who offer them. Um, so uh, a, a transit employee will never be fully self-liquidating. I do understand that, Mr. Papadox. Um, we do. I know we do subsidize it, but did we look to? Well, is it anticipated the improvements to the service, eliminating the on-demand and the, the new system that's come up? Did anybody consider or project uh, how much the ridership would go up based on the new system? I, I don't even know if that's possible, but did anybody do a model to 
estimate whether our ridership will go up in proportion uh, to the additional costs we're about to take on potentially. Uh, through, through you, Mr. Chair, that's uh, the request. The question about uh, what potential revenue we could see, we will get back to council on that and report back on that. Um, the, 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 the comment about the ability to do um, modeling, we didn't have the time or luxury uh, or funds to bring a consultant on to do additional modeling. So the modeling we're relying on is that which was prepared for the previous system. Um, so we would have to use a, a a, a rough projection, which is what we'll do when we report back on the earlier question about how much revenue, what revenue impacts we would imagine or potentially see from these additional um, additional route enhancements. Okay, thank you. I do have some confidence that with uh, the, all the work that's been done on this, uh, the, imp the improvements that are projected uh, to the transit system that we will see ridership increase. If you make it convenient for people, they will use it. Um, if you know, our workers show up and we don't have to cancel routes all the time and it becomes reliable to our citizens, I do believe it, it will be much better uh, than we've experienced. And a lot of that is perception, but I think this is a solid step forward um, going forward. And I, I, I do anticipate that transit will, it's going to improve and increase ridership, which will increase revenue as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Purnell. Councillor Duguay for a second time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Beamer. I was remiss in not um, including as my previous remarks, advising uh, committee members and staff that the uh, city's accessibility advisory committee will be hold, having or staging a special meeting Thursday or Wednesday of this week at 4 p.m. to consider this report because the report was produced um, after the re regular meeting, I would anticipate that the committee will be in support of uh, the report as pr produced uh, for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor DeGay. Any further comments or questions? Moved by Councillor Real. I think Councillor Vastiatis asked to separate out A to E, so we'll just take a separate vote on each one. So we'll start with uh, A. Okay. Councillor Duguay, are you a yay? Yes. That is carried. Item B. That is carried. C. That is carried. D. That is carried. And E. And that is carried. Thanks, everyone. So uh, we do have a notice of motion. Councillor DeGay, if you can read in the notice of motion, then you're welcome to speak to it. Mr. Chairman, you wish for me to read it all? Yeah, we, we do need you to read it all just to get it in the right. Everybody, record. just to make it official. Sit back and get comfortable. This is going to take a couple of minutes. Um, the um, motion. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, whereas the city desires to continue receiving category three services from ORCA, that being the Autonomy Region Conservation Authority, under a cost apportioning agreement, and whereas ORCA's category three services are certain local water monitoring programs, climate change initiatives, and land stewardship services, which are more specifically set out in the program descriptions for the cost apportionment agreement, and whereas the province of Ontario has required all conservation authorities to report back by no later than 
the 9th of October 2023 on the city's to decision to continue receiving these Category 3 services. And whereas the city will be assessed and then pay an apportionment of the cost for the Category 3 programs and services in accordance with the following formula, 3% of the apportioned value the city is required to pay for ORCA for general operating expenses and Category 1 expenses as defined in Regulation 400 and Ontario Regulation 402 forward slash 22 under the Conservation Authorities Act RSO 1990 C.27. And whereas the city's annual cost for Category 3 programs and services has been has historically been part of an annual levy and is now required to be broken out as per regulation, Ontario Regulation 402 forward slash 22 and is already contained in the annual budget for infrastructure and planning services. Now, be it resolved that the Council for the City of Peterborough authorizes its Chief Administrative Officer and City Clerk to execute a cost apportionment agreement in a form acceptable to the City Solicitor in order for the City to continue to receive ORCA's Category 3 services. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Hey, thank you, Councillor Degay. Any comments or questions to that? Uh, Councillor Lachika? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I just wanted to thank Councillor Degay for, for the motion. And, and uh, in, in my estimation, it looks good and it follows what uh, we can understand to be the separation of specific cost appointment uh, services as per the provincial changes. So thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Lachik. Any further comments or questions? We'll take a vote. Okay, you're out. All right, we got you as a yes. And that is carried. Other business, anyone? Other business, Councillor Baldwin? Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, I just wanted to remind uh, councillors and the public of the uh, Chief Betts' uh, town hall to be taking place next Monday evening between 6.30 and 8 o'clock at the Healthy Planet um, Arena, and all are welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Baldwin. Other business? Motion to adjourn, Councillor Parnell. We'll take a vote. Yes, Sir Keith? Oh, yeah. And just to remind everyone, please do not sign out. Uh, computer will be in updates tonight, so please do not log out. And that is carried. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week.